All right, we are in Exodus 34 this morning. And uh, remember, we left off with Moses. You know, we he come down the mountain and broke the tablets and was angry at the people because they were, uh, you know, in a, a drunken orgy and, and they had forgotten that Moses was up on the mountain. They thought that he had died and, and that they had no more leader. And, and so they talked to Aaron and, and he uh, made this calf for them. And Moses come down, confronted Aaron. He says, uh, you know, the people, they wanted this God. So he threw this gold in the fire and out popped this calf. <laughs> and so, and then God says, well, go ahead and carve out new stones and I'll, I'll, I'll write the Ten Commandments again for you. So come back up the mountain. Don't let the people follow you up. And he leaves off with the instructions on, uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to make a covenant with you and come on up this mountain and we're going to start over. So that's where we're at in Exodus 34. It says, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets, which you shattered. <laughs> so be ready by morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and present yourself there to me on, top, on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not gaze in front of the mountain. So, verse 4 says, So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. Verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So let's stop there for a second. God proclaims his name. He says, I am the Lord. And the Lord, remember, all capitals, L-O-R-D, means the pre-existent one, the I am, the one who has always been. And that is the, the name of the Lord that is unproclaimed. You can't even, they couldn't even pronounce his name. They wouldn't even say the name of the Lord. They wouldn't write the full name of the Lord. That, so it was so revered, re, 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 revealed, revealed, revered, 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 there you go, um, that they wouldn't even say the whole name of the Lord. And God is proclaiming his name, and he's going to forgive iniquity, which another word for perversity. He's going to forgive transgression, which is rebellion, and sin, which is missing the mark. And yet, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Now, this has been taken out of context and 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 um, believe that if uh, if you sin, then your children and your grandchildren, your great grandchildren will suffer for it. Well, that's not the case here. That's not what this is saying here. This is saying that God, he just got done saying he is forgiving the iniquity, the transgressions and the sins. Right. But he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So he will forgive if you ask for forgiveness. If you have a repentant heart, he will forgive you. But he's going to see the same perversities, rebellion, and missing the marks from generation to generation to generation because sin is carried on through the generations. It is a hereditary thing. 
And so God will see the same sins from the same family through the generations. He's going to visit those sins, and he's going to give you the opportunity to be forgiven of those sins, those perversities and the rebellions against him. And that's what it's saying here. He's going to visit those. And if you repent, you'll be forgiven. If you do not repent, when he visits those perversities, rebellions, and missing the marks, the sins, then you will be punished. So it's still your choice. You don't sin because your grandfather sinned, and you don't sin the same sins because of him. You have a tendency to sin the same way because it's passed through the generations. And that's all this is saying here. So this is not God punishing the children and the grandchildren to follow because the sins of the fathers. This is God showing us how family sins follow through the generations. And one can look in the history of one's family and see how this is so true. It takes a lot to break the chains of trans transgressions in a family tree, but it only takes one person in that tree to repent and break that tree, break that chain. We, uh, we tend to naturally move from good to evil through generations. And I don't know if you've seen this. The Bible really shows, points this out. But if you look in the history of the United States, let's say, the founding fathers, for the most part, most of them were Christians. And they, for the most part, all of them, believed in God. And they had this great uh, sense of following Christ. And they founded this country on those beliefs. As we get farther away from those beliefs, see how the generations have moved away from that. How the generations has tried to kick, they've kicked God out of the schools. They used to have the Bible in the school, and that was the textbook. You don't see that today. So you see the generations moving farther and farther away from God. As individuals, we can make a difference. We can choose God in our lives and then stop that chain of deterioration. So, But that's also something we need to look at, too, is it's so important for grandparents to be involved in their children's lives and their great or their grandchildren's lives and their great great or great grandchildren great great if you live long enough children's lives to show them christ um amy's grandmother brought her to the lord my grandfather was a great christian my grandmother on and they they uh showed us christ and and how they lived and stuff on and they and they taught their daughter that my mother and I grew up in a household that believed in Christ. And that's why I believe in Christ, because of the influence I had, they had on me. And then so we show our children this, and we show our grandchildren this, and we try to live the lives that Christ wants us to live. And that's so important, because we are naturally moving from good to evil through the generations. Verse 8 says, Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord be along in our midst. Or let the Lord go along in our midst. For though the people are so obstinate and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your own possession. And so, remember in past... Uh, verses in the past chapters that we went through god says your people moses i'm not going to go with them i'm going to drive out the people in the land but i'm not going with them because they're so obstinate i'm going to kill them remember that and, and moses says no 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 we don't want to go unless you go with us and this is him saying again lord if now i have found favor in your sight O lord i pray let the lord go along in our midst so he's, and the word Lord here is not let Yahweh go, but let the boss go. He is the boss now. You are the Lord of our life. You are our boss. Um, let, let the boss go along in our midst. 
you are our boss, and we're going to obey you. And even though this is an obstinate people, please forgive us of our iniquity and our sin and go with us. And then God says in verse 10, then God said, behold, I am going to make a covenant. Before all your people, I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations. Now, we've seen some pretty amazing miracles up to this point. Remember, he's parted the Red Sea. He's he's delivered these, these uh, plagues on Egypt. And he's shown his love by separating the people of Israel from the people of Israel of uh, Egypt in these plagues and he separated them out and he's shown how he loves his people and how he he set them apart and he doesn't want them to go into destruction but he says here before all you your people I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth nor among any of the nations so we're going to see some things come up that he's never done before and this is exciting because you can actually see from this point on up until the end of the age this plays out you will see miracles from this point clear until the end uh, of the book in revelation you will see the miracles that's never been performed before god follows through with his word and all the people among whom you live will see the working of the lord for it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. Be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. Behold, I am going to drive out the Amorite before you the, and the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going. Or it will become a snare in your midst. So he knows ahead of time, obviously. He's God. He's like, don't make a covenant with any of these people because it's going to become a snare to you. And he's going to tell you why here in just a second. But rather, you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their ashram. For you shall not worship any other god for the Lord, Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with this inhabitants of the land, and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and someone might invite you to eat of the sacrifice, and you might take some of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters might play the harlot with their gods and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. So that's why. He's, idolatry is spiritual adultery. And if you follow after these false gods, then you are committing spiritual adultery here. And when the scriptures say God is a jealous God, we automatically think of, or I used to think, negative connotations. Oh, he's a jealous God? That's, that's terrible. Anytime we see a jealousy is always a bad thing, right? Well, it is for us because when we're jealous, I, I'm going to get to that. Let me just, let's talk about what jealousy actually, what the God's jealousy of God actually is. And in uh, Jacinius, the Hebrew Chaldean lexicon, it says jealous is used of God as not bearing any rival. Okay? Used of God. So jealousy used of God as not bearing any rival. And the severe avenger of departure from himself. Okay. So if you have if you have a jealous God, it's because there is no rival, and he is the avenger of departure from himself. So when you move away from God, he will even avenge that. Okay, so you see, if the creator of the universe says he alone is God. Who are we to argue? Um, this jealousy is a righteous jealousy. The reason God can be jealous is because there is no one greater in the entire universe than he is. So when we're jealous, um, it's sin because we are not supposed to covet, right? 
when we covet our neighbor's wife or car, or we're, we could, we become jealous of them, right? So when we covet, we're wanting something that is greater to be ours. When God is jealous, he wants all things less than him to worship only him. He's not jealous of something greater than he is. He's jealous of the lesser, and he wants everyone to trust in him, to believe in him, to, to follow him. So that's a righteous jealousy. It would be like, it would be like God, if, if we are jealous of um, our grand, uh, a grandkid coming up and not ever acknowledging that he loves us or that, or he would um, never call us by grandma or grandpa or, or something like that. We'd be a little jealous, like, come on, you know, <laughs> but see, but that's not even a righteous jealousy. I can't, I can't even put this into um, human words. It's just, you just got to, just got to see that God is the highest there is. And if you don't trust in him, he's jealous because that's all he wants from us. He wants the best for us. So we should take a self-exam. Okay, is there anyone or is there anything in our lives we put first before God? Now think carefully because we all say, oh, I love my wife, but, you know, God's first. And then I love my wife. But is that really true? Think, think carefully. Is there anything we are not willing to give up or give away? Think of your possessions. Think of your house and your cars and your trains, sets, and your toys, and your guns. Is there anything that you're not willing to just give away? If God asked you to do that, if God asked you to sell everything and move to Siberia, could you do that? If you really knew it was God saying that. Is there anything we'll not be willing to give away? Is there anyone you would not put? Or is there anyone you would put before God? Do you put any one person that you know in your life before God? Do we put other relationships before our relationship with God? Now think about that one. Just think carefully. Do we put relationships before our relationship with God? How much personal time do we really spend with God? If you spend as much time with your spouse as you do with God and spent the rest of your time with friends, would your spouse be jealous? Oh, that makes you think a little bit there. Think of these things for a while, and now you know God is a jealous God for a reason. Because none of us really, or I don't, I don't really put God first, do I? If I spend as much time with Amy as I spend with God, and then spend time with everybody else the rest of the time, um, I don't think Amy would be very happy with me. So that tells me I need to spend a little more time with God than I do. So he wants to have a relationship with his people. That's what it boils down to. Verse 17, you shall make for yourself no molten gods. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread. As I commanded you, as the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. The first offspring from every womb belongs to me. And all your male livestock, the first offspring from cattle and sheep, you shall redeem with a lamb, the first offspring from a donkey. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. So if you have a donkey, a firstborn of the donkey, if you don't redeem it with a lamb, you break that, break that donkey's neck because it's God's. 
and God will get it one way or the other. So if you don't redeem it with a lamb, you break its neck. You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons. Now you can't break their necks. Sometimes we want to break our firstborn son's necks, but <laughs> then, then we change our minds. So anyway, name. Uh, none shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest you shall rest. You shall celebrate the feast of weeks, that is, the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. So later on, when they build the temple, and so at this time, it's at the tent. So everybody shows up, all the males shows up at the tent three times a year. In the future, when the tent is at Shiloh, they all come to Shiloh and, and they meet there. But then later on, when the, the, the build, when Solomon builds the temple in Jerusalem, all the males are to come to Jerusalem three times a year, at least three times a year. Now, they can come more than that, but they are required to come three times a year. The first one is verse 18, you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Passover time. So that you have the Passover, then unleavened bread, and that's they have to come to Jerusalem. All the males have to come to Jerusalem and observe that feast. The second one is verse 22, you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks. So they have to come to Jerusalem, and that's the Feast of Weeks. And the third is the Feast of an end gathering at the turn of the year. So at their new year, this is this is another gathering that they need to come and and uh, to Jerusalem to to and the and the reason for the mandatory feasts each year is and he says here for I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders. So this they they observe three a year, at least the three a year they have to come in because God drove out the enemies for verse twenty four for I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders. And no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. So it's also a, a test, right? So they have to leave their land behind, and they go to Jerusalem, and they got to trust in God that no one's going to covet their land and come and take over while they're away. So it's a trust thing, too. Verse 25, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. Now it's going to get into some of the rules that uh, that he went through before. So you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast, the Passover, to be left over until morning. You shall bring the first fruit, or the very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words. For in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water. Now that would kill you. If you did that, if you did not eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights, you would die. The only reason. Moses doesn't die here is because he's in the presence of the Lord. And, Mo and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And those who eat this bread will not, or drink this cup, or drink this water. I'm, I'm the water, and who drinks this water will never thirst again. And who eats this bread of my life will not hunger. So he... didn't thirst or eat for 40 days or 40 nights. He is living on God, the Holy Spirit. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now, the he here is should have been capitalized because the he here is the Lord. For it was the Lord who wrote on the tablets again. He told Moses to carve out new stone tablets like the ones he broke, and the Lord said he was going to write on them again like he did the first time. 
So God told Moses to write all the all that he had said before this in the book. And he I'm sure he told him you know, he told him everything. And he wrote. He wrote Genesis on this mountain, I believe, because God told him how he started the whole the earth and how he, he began everything. He wrote all that down because the Lord told him right here to write it in a book. So God told Moses everything he needed to write in Genesis and, and up, you know, and Exodus. He wrote all this out and then he's going to write the next three books too. But right here, God wrote on the Ten Commandments on the ta stone tablets. In verse 29, it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain. Now, just think of what Moses was thinking. I'm, I'm thinking if he's, he may be thinking, now he may not have been, I don't know. But if I was Moses, I'd be thinking, oh, please, Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord, don't be doing that. Don't be doing that again. I don't want to do this again. Right? <laughs> so, because the last time he did this exact same thing, they were, they were in a drunken orgy down at the bottom of the mountain. Well, this time is a little different. So he comes down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the, the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. That's speaking with God. So Moses' face shone because he just spent the last 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. And they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him. And Moses spoke to them. And afterward, all the sons of Israel came near. And he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went to speak with him again. So every time God spoke to Moses, he would come, Moses would come out of the tent and his face would be glowing. And so he would put the veil on his face. He come down off the mountain. The people saw that his face was glowing because he was in the presence of God. He put a veil over his face. But Moses didn't put the veil on his face because of the glowing of his skin. He put the veil on his face so the children of Israel wouldn't see the glow fade away. Exodus 35 Verse 1, then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, This is a thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever, so let me read that again. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. Let him bring it as the Lord's contribution. Gold, silver, and bronze, and blue, purple, scarlet material, fine linen, goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and pur porpoise skins, and acacia wood, and oil for lighting, and spices for anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and setting stones for the ephod, and for the breastpiece. Let every skillful man among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded the tabernacle, its tent and its covering, its hooks and its, its, uh, its hooks and its boards, its bars, its pillars, 
its sockets. So everything, so up until, remember, he gave Moses the instructions. Excuse me. He gave Moses the instructions on what to do to build the tabernacle and the, the tent of meeting. And so he is asking for, the, for them to give to the Lord these things that's going to be needed to build this, this, this tent. And the ark and its poles, the mercy seat, and the curtain of the screen, the table and its poles, and all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, so the, the showbread, the lampstand, also for the light, and its utensils, and its lamps, and the oil for the light, and the altar of incense, and its poles. And the anointing oil and the fragrance incense and the screen for, so he leaves nothing unsaid here. Goes through the details again of everything that's going to go into this tent of meeting, this tabernacle. And he's saying this, give to the Lord with a willing heart. And the screen for the doorway at the entrance of the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering with its bronze grating, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hanging of the court, its pillars and its sockets, and the screen for the gate of the court, the pegs of the tabernacle and the pegs of the court and their cords, the woven garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons, to minister as priests. Then, verse 20, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence. Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. So they left Moses and they went and then the Lord moved on their hearts and they brought all this stuff to Moses so that they can start building the, the tabernacle. Then all the all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and bracelets, all articles of gold. So did every man who's, who presented an offering of gold to the Lord Every man who had in his possession blue and purple and scarlet material and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and porpoise skins brought them. Everyone who could make a contribution of silver and bronze brought the Lord's contribution. And every man who had in his possession acacia wood for any work of the service brought it. Now they're walking around in the desert, right? So I was thinking... Why would they have acacia wood? But if you think about it, these nomads, they put up their tents and they would set up their tents and they would use these acacia wood, these poles for their own tents. And maybe they had some spares and they'd haul them around too. And, and so they were giving of their household. They were giving the things that they had for the Lord's work. So all the skilled women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and scarlet material and in fine linen. All the women whose hearts stood or stirred with a skill spun the goat hair. The rulers brought the onyx. The rulers brought the onyx stones and the stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And the spice and the oil for the light and for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense. The Israelites, all the men and women, whose heart moved them to bring material for all the work which the Lord had commanded through Moses to be done, brought a free will offering to the Lord. So when we give God, when we give, God expects us to give freely. We're to bring free will offerings to the Lord. Is money one of the things we're holding on so tightly we can't give to God? He says, a tenth is his. Then he says, the offering is above and beyond that. When we give, we must examine our hearts and give with a good heart. Because if we don't give with a good heart, 
we don't get a reward for that. And we don't give because we're going to get a reward. We get a reward because we give of the free heart. And if you feel like you're going to give to get a reward, then maybe your heart's not in it in the first place. Or if you give and you tell everybody how much you give and, oh, I'm, I give all this and I've done all this, um, you'll get your reward here on earth. You don't get it in heaven because you got your reward here because people are like, oh, my goodness, look at this person. He gave so much. Yay. So <laughs> this is this is one of the <coughs> <coughs> this is one of the most difficult places in Scripture. Anything that has to do with giving is, is a difficult place in Scripture for pastors because um, we have to be careful because um, giving is can can really wreck a, a, a place, wreck a congregation, and so we we have to have a giving heart. We have to give for the right reasons, and we have to examine ourselves like they did here. There's a free will offering to the Lord. It says also, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. So. We give in secret because our Lord and God, he will reward us openly in heaven. And uh, I will always say here at Cross T, um, your giving is between you and the Lord. I don't make a big deal about it. When we, when we, when we receive the offering, we, we notate it down and stuff, but we don't go, oh, my goodness, look at this person. We never, ever do that. We pray over the offering. We're completely. You know, we, we completely godly when we do this, we never esteem one person higher than another, okay? Everyone gives out of the abundance of their heart, and we know that God has um, blessed you in your giving, and so we, we, don't, uh, we don't esteem anyone higher than the other. So... I just want you to know that. And so moving on, verse 30. Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called, has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now remember he, when he uh, called Bezalel and stuff, and we had talked about how um, God chose him by name for the, 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 the things that he's going to do. Verse 31, and he has filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all the craftsmanship to make designs for working in gold and in silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for setting and in the carving of wood, so as to perform in every inventive work. He also has put in his heart to teach both he and Ohiliab the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to perform every work of an engraver and of a designer and of an embroiderer in blue and in purple, in scarlet and in fine linen, and of a weaver as performers of every work and maker of designs. So when God asks us to do something for him, when he calls us, he will also give us the ability to do it. And so often we disqualify ourselves and do not trust in the Lord when he calls his people. He will equip his people as well. And if something, if we remember this, it doesn't matter what he has called us to do. He may call us to be the janitor or he may call us to be a, a provider of services, a mechanic, a preacher, uh, someone who cleans toilets. Or whatever he does, whatever he calls us to do, he will equip us to do that as well. And everything we're, we do, we're supposed to do in the Lord. So, Father, we ask that you would, uh, would guide our ways and walk our ways and, and help us to walk in you, Lord. Father, we, we ask that you would heal our bodies of any sicknesses that we are encountering and our loved ones and our friends. And Father, heal our land and our nation. Father, this is 
some hard times that we're going through right now and we know that everything happens it's according to your will and we just ask that you would uh, comfort us in what you are showing us through all this and lord i pray that that you would uh, lift each and every one of us up that we might trust in you even more through all of this and that we might be a light and uh, um, and show others the true love of god in our lives and compassion and show christ through all of this in jesus name amen <laughs>